Oh boy, I thought we were done with this. Okay, so Aaron, no, wait, wait, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Logan Dublin University has made a new video which in the title says that physics support Aaron 1912's Titanic theory. Are you serious? For any of you who don't know, Logan Dublin University is Aaron 1912. He's created over a dozen accounts all over the internet where all he does is just pat himself on the back. He's done the same thing on YouTube. He's going to cry and cry and cry and cry and cry that he's Aaron. He's not Aaron 1912. I can tell you, he's Aaron 1912. So, instead of just going over the theory, going over the video, picking apart the survivor accounts, I've already done that. What I'm going to do is just focus on the first 1 minute and 30 seconds of this new video because that's primarily where he presents his quote-unquote physics evidence. So let's just jump right in and let me pour myself some whiskey. Okay. So the first thing that you're shown in the video is water does not increase weight, it decreases buoyancy. This is a fact. In fact, many of my own YouTube commenters have commented on my old video where I tried to debunk his theory that said, you know, actually I agreed with everything you said, except that, you know, when water enters a ship, it doesn't make the ship more heavy. It just decreases the buoyancy of the ship. That's true. And that's something that I got wrong. I'm very sorry, but at least I'm willing to admit when I make mistakes. The next thing he shows is ships sink because they can't maintain buoyancy. Again, maybe there's hope for him after all. The next thing that he shows is the bow still has buoyancy. What? The bow is nearly full of water. Here. Here is a screenshot of Titanic from James Cameron's 2012 flooding simulation that was run with sophisticated software specifically designed to show how ships flood. Notice that the bow is nearly full of water. While it technically does have some buoyancy from the rapidly depleting air inside of it, this doesn't make the entire bow buoyant. Clearly not buoyant enough to rise once the break starts. The remaining buoyancy in the ship is situated in the middle and the stern. So the next thing he says is cut the bow free and it'll rise up. Only if the bow's buoyancy can overcome the water inside the bow will it begin to rise once the break happens. This simulation Aaron claims to have happened can only occur if the bow was still maintaining buoyancy. It can't do that if it's full of water. If the break happened shortly after the collision, then yes, the bow could have risen back up out of the water because it wasn't full of water and therefore still buoyant. Physics example number one. <laughs> oh god. Aaron shows a clip of a car sinking into the water from the movie Transporter 3. The clip in question shows a man taking balloons and attaching them to his sinking car's tires. The air fills the balloons and the car rises from the water. Air doesn't magically change its properties by switching from one container, a tire, to another container, a balloon, while underwater. The average tire is inflated to a PSI of 35 pounds per square inch. If you take the volume of a 35 PSI tire and transfer that to a balloon, it's still going to have the same volume inside the balloon as it did in the tire, which means if the car was already sinking when the air was in the tires, it's going to continue sinking if the air is now in the balloons. I think we all know that relying on Hollywood for accurate physics 
is somewhat of an oxymoron. I would assume a channel claiming to be associated with an actual university would recognize this. My physics professor agrees with Aaron 1912's study. Oh, so it's, it's not the actual university. It's a university student who knows of Aaron, who showed this to a physics professor who has now a-okayed everything. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, I get it now. Before I even watched this video from Logan Dublin University's channel, I knew that it was Aaron 1912. I've went to multiple Titanic communities online where the video has been shared, and the general consensus from those who are both new to the community and those who have been around a long time is that the channel is owned and operated by Aaron 1912. He's not been crafty at hiding his abuse of new usernames and multiple accounts while on board message forums like Encyclopedia Titanica in the past, so why would he be any different on YouTube? Just take a look at the video description if you require any more proof that Logan Dublin University is Aaron 1912. He's even gone so far as to disable comment replies because the vast majority of them he was getting began explaining to him how physics simply can't allow a nearly flooded or fully flooded bow to resurface. Instead of simply allowing the comments to go unnoticed, he either disables the comments or deletes the ones that don't make it look like rainbows of truth and justice flow out of his asshole. When the ship breaks apart, the weight of the bow will significantly decrease as the stern will no longer force the bow downwards. I'm just going to call you out here, Aaron. If you're going to be nitpicky like many in my own comment section have been and pointing out that the water doesn't increase the weight of the bow and only makes it less buoyant, I'm going to do the same with this statement here. The weight of the bow is always going to remain the same, unless Godzilla makes another appearance after a few bench presses and gouges a hole out of it, of course. If the stern breaks away from the bow, it doesn't affect the weight of the bow, only the weight of the overall now fractured ship. Also, as the stern rises up, it's trying to push the bow underneath the water due to its weight, but the other thing that's making the bow sink is the lack of buoyancy in the bow. You know, the thing that you claim made the bow resurface. The remaining buoyant forces within the bow will now have greater effect in providing buoyant ascension. I... what? Again, air doesn't magically make something more buoyant because you want it to be buoyant or that it's transferred to a container. If the bow is buoyant, it's not going to be forced underwater and stay there for nearly two and a half hours. Just because the stern rose up in defiance and asked the bow to go take a time out. For someone so versed in the law of physics, I wonder if you've taken implosions into account. You know, what happens when air becomes trapped inside a container as it sinks? Eventually, the pressure of the water overcomes the pressure of the air inside the container and causes the container to implode. This is what's normally attributed as to why the stern looks like it does today. Not only did it slam into the seafloor, but it imploded while it sank. Why did it implode? Because it was full of air. Between two of these images of the wreck, which one looks to be in better condition? The bow, obviously, because it doesn't look like a bomb's been detonated over it. Why is that? Because there wasn't any air in the bow when it sank, meaning it didn't implode. While we're on the subject of implosions, one atmosphere of pressure is 15 pounds per square inch. For every 32 feet of depth, the seawater outside the ship is going to exert an additional atmosphere pressure on the hull of the ship, or an extra 15 pounds per square inch for every 32 feet that the ship is underneath the surface. The stern began imploding shortly after it was fully submerged, so let's say within 30 seconds, because survivors have no general timeline of when they said they heard the implosions. So we know that the crush depth of the ship, or the point at which the implosion damage is going to occur, is near the surface and not near the ocean floor. Now why is this important? Because you're trying to claim that air is somehow still inside the bow. Now let's just see something here. 
When sitting normally in the water, Titanic was roughly 30 to 32 feet in the water. This means that the hull of the Titanic was designed to withstand the pressure of at least one to two atmospheres of pressure. Otherwise, the ship's hull would buckle and fail from her simply sitting in the water. Most experts agree that the ship was down by the bow about 10 degrees when the plunge began, or to put it simply, when the bridge went under. So here's a quick mock-up I did of the ship with a 10 degree forward list. Each one of these cubes that you see on the right side of the screen represents 32 feet, or one atmosphere of pressure. Remember, the further down you go along this line, the more pressure is being exerted on the hull, assuming that it's still full of air, that is. We know that due to the stern imploding near the surface, that it wouldn't have taken very many additional atmospheres of pressure on the hull for the implosions to begin. As you can see, the foremost part of the bow is already double, nearly triple actually, the amount of pressure that it's normally withstanding, assuming that it's still full of air, that is. But Titanic Animations, he said the bow resurfaced after the breakup occurred. Not during the plunge, silly Billy. Well, hidey ho, you're right. Here's what the ship looked like with a 23 degree angle of forward trim. Notice that the foremost part of the bow is now being subjected to nearly 10 atmospheres of pressure. The prow of the ship, the foremost part, is roughly 256 feet below the ocean surface at this time, the time that the breakup began. Most experts will already tell you that the stern began imploding within 200 feet of the ocean surface, meaning that if there were any air in this segment of the bow, the foremost part, it was already imploding when the breakup started. But wait a minute, looking back at the image of the wreck of the bow, the very front of the ship doesn't look like it suffered implosion damage at all. I wonder why.